Hello, welcome back to the Cube here at our New York Stock Exchange studio as part of the NYSC and the Cube Wired programming community. We've got a great series on the AI factor, the future of computing, the future of data centers, the future of large scale software systems that are rolling out, of course. You know, Quantum's a big part of it. Peter Shadbolt's here, co-founder and chief scientific officer of SciQuantum. Raised a billion dollars in their recent funding and continuing to push the envelope. Peter, thanks for coming in uh, remote into our studio here in New York. You're actually in where our other studio is in, in the Bay Area. So uh, thanks for coming in. Oh, thanks for having us. I really appreciate it. So obviously, you know, the, the uh, NVIDIA's and the open source area and large scale computing, GPUs, XPUs has really brought a lot of attention to quantum. And uh, you know, you go back a couple of years ago, quantum was, when is it going to come out? Who's got what? You start to see real visibility into a, an accelerated push towards that next level. Um, some of the best companies now are working, writing algorithms, the NIST, NIST standards are aligning. You're starting to see real um, enthusiasm converting into confidence. Can you share quickly, you guys just raised a billion dollars on your last financing, well-funded, going hard. Where are we on the reality? I mean, I know it's very nuanced, but share your opinion on what, what the market's doing right now. It's clearly, it's not just being ready, people are doing stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, firstly, it's exciting that uh, people are building big computers again. You know, uh, it was pretty unfashionable to build supercomputers 10 years ago. And currently it's very fashionable to build supercomputers for AI and so on. So that's sort of the environment in which we're operating. Um, and then this idea of a categorically new kind of supercomputer, a quantum computer has been around for decades. Academics have been working on it in universities for a long, long time. And then I think you're absolutely right that the field is now going through a phase transition where it's coming out of the research lab. People are starting to knock down some of the major technical milestones. Uh, people are starting to get serious about building really large scale, commercially useful machines. Um, and uh, we are um, poised to break ground on really, really big systems uh, within a matter of months. So I think it's a really exciting time for the field. Today, nobody has a useful quantum computer. Um, and so in that sense, we're a few years behind AI, I would say, which is undoubtedly useful today. Um, but we're moving at a very, very fast pace and, and really excited to get this stuff over the line. Yeah, well, it's congratulations, and we love following the progress. It's funny, if you even go back Thank 12 you. months, right? Oh yeah, quantum, that's uh, 10 years away, and then it's five, and insiders, it's three, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. And uh, I smile because you never know the pace of uh, the innovation, the way the market is right now um, with computing. And I have to ask you, too, because like one of the things people talk about in the press, I just want to get it out there, because it's talked about is, they call it the Y2K moment. There's a little doom and gloom. I don't mean to be negative, and I'm not. But there's a little bit of doom and yeah. gloom around, you know, it's a Y2K potential extinction event if these keys are encrypted and, and har harvested and decrypted, it could take down Bitcoin. That, that, that's kind yeah. of on the doom and gloom. But yet there's the science side of it, right? There's things like, how do you go from uh, supercomputing today, which we're seeing massive acceleration, from like even the old high performance computing terminals that were like moving inch by inch mm -hmm. every year. Yeah, a new thing, it's only, it takes three weeks to do that wing design if you're Boeing, now it's faster. Yeah. What's the bridge yeah. between the reality of the science um, and, and reality? Because there's a lot more than just quantum. There's, there's uh, fault tolerance, there's systems design, there's transitions, and then there's maybe mm -hmm. pure play use cases. So talk about that reality, and then we'll kind of get into the kind of the, the what people are doing on pure quantum. Yeah, so our, you know our company is building a very large scale fault tolerant quantum computer. We're doing it uh, through leverage of high volume chip manufacturing. So we build our wafers in a commercial semiconductor fab, and we're going to use it primarily for commercial applications. Um, in chemistry, materials science, drug discovery, fuels, catalyst, fertilizers, new semiconductor manufacturing processes. You know, we're going to use this machine to accelerate innovation at the foundations of our advanced society. And we think that's a you know commercially lucrative thing to do. You also touch on 
uh, crypt cryptography and the potential for quantum computers to break current cryptographic methods. And that is not fantasy, you know, that's a really serious future application of quantum computing that is um, a double-edged sword, you know, it's a yeah. powerful tool and it also comes with risks and challenges and all sorts of profound implications. I think the simple thing to say on that topic is that we expect the former set of commercial applications to come well before the uh, cryptographically relevant systems are ready. And so my glib way of expressing this is that we expect to get rich before we become dangerous. <laughs> There's a parallel universe in which uh, nature conspired to force us to become dangerous before we get rich. And that would be unfortunate. Luckily, we don't live in that world. Yeah, and, I, and that's a great comment. I want to highlight some of the things you mentioned around um, being the forcing function. In all these markets, standards are huge, right? Can you comment on the role of standards? Because this is what can galvanize these big step function changes because this is, again, going to be a significant architecture change. I mean, it's more power, yeah. horsepower for sure, like a better description. Yeah. What's the role of standards? Because in all these key market flexes, of, go back 40 years in computing. The future of computing was grounded in either academic research, government funding, and standards. Huge. Can you yeah. comment on the role of what standards and how academic and then now commercial entrepreneurs <laughs> can align and why that's important? Yeah, so, so quantum computing is still very early. You know, it's emerging out of research groups where people are doing stuff that has no standards at all, right? Like complete Wild West physics research by a bunch of PhD students is where, where quantum computing starts out. But um, our approach has been to recognize that we can't do this on our own, uh, that if we're going to get to these really big systems of millions of qubits, we need to leverage the trillion dollars and 50 years of work and alignment and standards that you describe. Um, we need to leverage that to our advantage. And so our whole approach really is to understand that we have to work with the semiconductor industry and work within the constraints of a big fab and an existing supply chain and contract manufacturing and so on and so on. We really need to find a way to fit quantum computing within those constraints rather than working against that existing capability by demanding, you know, atomic scale fabrication and crazy new materials and things that just kind of go completely against the grain of the momentum of the semiconductor industry. So that was really our founding thesis and we've executed on that. We also just uh, yesterday released our software tools uh, called Construct. So that's a software package for programming quantum computers. And that comes with a bunch of open source uh, tooling uh, for standardizing and sort of capturing these quantum algorithms in a way that can be yeah. interchanged between, between teams. And so, yeah, we, on the algorithms and software side, yeah. standardization, open source uh, 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 tools are really, really important in the same way that they have been yeah. for AI, you know, things like PyTorch and yeah. uh, CUDA and so on. Um, we're working on, on very similar kind of landscape, yeah. I love the fact that you're putting out that developer angle on that. Um, I have to ask you, in all these big movements, is always kind of like, and we've heard this from Steve Jobs, Sam Altman kind of refers to it with OpenAI, and almost every major breakthrough, there's always, we meant it for that, but that actually happened. Um, are you yeah. seeing patterns in, because when you start throwing out the developers, you're going to see some usage. Are there, mm -hmm. I mean, because the alphas are coming in, it's a whole other thing, different, it's a different game, but are there things that you see, either you expected or didn't expect, because what will come out of that, I believe, will be, uh, something that will help you with your mission. If you're going to build these centers uh, and continue to push the envelope, you're going to attract some serious yeah. people. Yeah, so one of the really cool things uh, that has happened is that our approach to building the quantum computer is based on silicon photonics. So that means uh, silicon chips that move light instead of electricity. These chips were originally developed for telecom and networking applications. 
uh, but we've needed to improve their performance well beyond the state of the art. So we've spent the last six years and more than $100 million making incredibly high performance photonics at Global Foundries Fab 8 in upstate New York. And that is suddenly becoming a topic of intense interest for the AI supercomputing people. So not nothing to do with quantum, yeah. just people who are building regular AI supercomputers. They want extremely demanding specs on this advanced photonic stuff. And it just so happens that we've got it. So that's one thing that, you know, it's still very early. We're not actually doing anything there yet. Um, but it yeah. is uh, sort of a increasingly yeah. um, frequent ask whether people can, can get access to that stuff. And so, yeah, that's a byproduct of the main mission of the company, which is a huge, huge yeah. endeavor. Uh, but it's pretty exciting that we've, we, we've already yeah. seen instances of these kind of unexpected yeah. um, byproducts of our, our work, yeah. Well, great to have you on, Peter. My final question is more on what's next, and I want to kind of tease it out with an um, illustration. Five years ago, I went to Supercomputing. Uh, it was, I think it was mm -hmm. in Atlanta, I forget when it was. Um, and that show started when I graduated college in 1988. It's like the oldest running show. Um, and it was yeah. basically high-performance computing. You know, terminals, yep. time sharing, large scale systems. I mean, state of the art. It just, it just felt like a b very boring, moving inch by inch, uh, not a lot of uh, needle moving progress. Yep. Yep. So I hear a little buzz, I go down there, I'm like, oh, this is just an HPC show. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to go walk to the restaurant. And down the hallway uh, in the meeting area was, I'm like, oh, the AWS is here? NVIDIA is here? Mm -hmm. I see signs, NVIDIA, AWS. Mm -hmm. Um, and mm -hmm. some other names, uh, Broadcom. I'm like, what the hell? What's going on here? This is like not a cloud show. I walk in, I sneak into the room. It was hardcore pre-AI developers. Yeah. I called Dave Vellante yeah. and I said, Dave, this show is going to be huge. It's going to shift to be an AI mm -hmm. show because we just connected the mm -hmm. dots on the spot. So th you know, that is a preamble. We expect supercomputing, maybe the show, maybe, but the concept, the category will evolve directly into quantum. Okay, so the question yes. is, what yes. are some of the actors, who will be in that room? What's the equivalent uh, tell sign, in your opinion, of kind of where that transition starts to connect? And again, this is a really simple illustration. AWS had cloud, they were doing nothing in AI. Now you, you look back and say it's obvious they were recruiting uh, people. Yeah. This is where now the game is going on. Quantum is going very quickly, and supercomputing has basically been the best advertising for quantum. What's your take on what's that connective tissue look like? What are the, what are this, what's this hell sign? Where's the canary in the coal mine? Yeah, well, I, th I think it's, it's, first of all, not, it, 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 I mean, it's great to see Google, Amazon, IBM, Microsoft, Intel, all doing like really serious work on quantum computing. And it speaks to the fact that, you know, it's appropriate to view quantum computing as the next frontier in you know a categorically um, new mode of computation, um, but I think that to your to your point and your, I love your story of going to this event ten years ago. When I came uh, to Silicon Valley about eight years ago, people told me, "Don't say HPC. Never say HPC." Right? Like <laughs> HPC is deeply unsexy. The whole idea of building big computers is very unfashionable. We're doing dating apps and dog walking and <laughs> uh, SaaS, right? Yeah. Um, and I think if you had told a lot of people in Silicon Valley eight, yeah. nine, 10 years ago, in a decade's time, the world's biggest company is going to be a supercomputer company that is predominantly doing what I think you can reasonably call scientific computing, right? Like the majority of people who run code on NVIDIA supercomputers are scientists yeah. like it's not too much of a crazy stretch to say that nvidia is a scientific computing company at this point like that would have blown people's minds yeah. they would have said absolutely not like you mean the gaming company the you mean the, ga the, ga you the, ga you mean the, the gaming phone. company that does bitcoin mining what are you talking about they yeah. just solve it's matrix so crazy. Ma matrix and, and, math and, and who so cares it's really exciting and yeah. i think it's part of a bigger trend yeah. where people are realizing that value is captured on the frontier and that uh, it's no coincidence, in my opinion, that many of our biggest and most durable, durably valuable companies today 
are right out on the frontier of extremely hard technology, TSMC, ASML, SpaceX, uh, NVIDIA. I think that's actually a testament uh, to um, yeah. what we're doing here. I think it's really exciting. And Peter. obviously we hope to one day earn our list, earn our name in that list of companies. Well, certainly we will definitely continue this conversation. You are on the frontier, value creation, value capture, and, and contribution, the open source. Again, this is, a, this is going to look a lot similar, but be different mm -hmm. than what we've seen. Major step function, change, major uh, innovation. Again, we're going to look back and say, quantum, that was fantasy. That was a, a, a right. secu cybersecurity nightmare. No, 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 it's right. going to be something bigger. And, and, and uh, congratulations on the funding. Um, I'm looking you. forward to, to seeing how all these uh, AI factories change the software equation. And AI is just a dream scenario too, is software is going to change too. So great stuff, thanks for coming on. I really, really appreciate it. And great to see you again, John. Thanks okay. for having us. Okay, I'm John Furrier with theCUBE here in the New York Stock Exchange. CUBE Studio East Coast, of course, we've got our Palo Alto connecting Wall Street and Silicon Valley, tech and money together. The money's on the frontier, the work's got to get done. That's where the value capture will start. And of course, we're doing our part as part of the NYSC and theCUBE, the NYSC Wired community. Check it out, fast growing. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching.